So what I'd like to do today is um, <clears throat> post the wastewater, um, or sorry, post, go over wastewater, question about posting wastewater videos. I haven't posted any wastewater videos. Um, I will be posting this one today. What we actually will do is I'm just going to do wastewater as a lecture. So you don't have to watch anything ahead of time. Um, I'll post this one. I will post Monday's lecture, and Monday's lecture will essentially be a continuation of today's lecture. So rather than kind of posting everything for you to watch in advance, um, you'll be good because you're here today, and then take uh, watch Monday's lecture, which I'm hoping we can finish a wastewater on Monday, and then I'll do a um, little exercise on wastewater with Wednesday's class. But I wanted to get through wastewater relatively quickly, so I thought this was probably the best way to do it. So what I would like to do is we'll go through the goals of wastewater treatment. We'll focus really on municipal treatment, look at the various individual processes that are used for wastewater treatment, um, and focus a little bit more on secondary treatment it's more complicated. We've talked about sedimentation, um, which is primary focus of wastewater treatment. We've talked about disinfection, which is used in wastewater treatment. But we haven't talked about uh, secondary treatment, which is really biological treatment in a wastewater plant. So just kind of a little bit thinking about wastewater first, we're going to talk, we're talking about domestic wastewater. So we're talking about what you flush down the toilet, what you flush down your kitchen sinks, laundry water. Um, let's see, what else? Um, laundry water, sink water, shower, bath, bathing water. Um, and then as mentioned, um, what is flushed down the toilet. So when we think about domestic wastewater, we talk about water sewage as fresh versus septic. So difference is that fresh sewage still has dissolved oxygen. It hasn't been biodegraded in any way. Um, Typically, it's a grayish color, and it typically has the odor of kind of that musty, freshly turned earth odor. Septic sewage is sewage that is devoid of oxygen. So it's anoxic, typically is black in color. Why? Because you're starting to form sulfides. And those sulfides, when they precipitate, tend to be a blackish color. Um, you can also start forming biofilms and microbial organisms. You, so the color changes. The odor changes. You've now got, because you've got the formation of sulfides, you've got this rotten egg, hydrogen sulfide smell. You also start uh, reducing the amino acids. So you start forming mercap mercaptans, which are sulfurous compound, organic compounds. Um, typical temperature is somewhere between 10 to 20 degrees C. And we're concerned with the biochemical oxygen demand. And typically we talk about that as a BOD5 or a five-day BOD. So biochemical oxygen de demand, why do, we, why do we care about what we refer to as BOD or what is BOD? What, it, what is BOD? Okay. It's the amount of oxygen consumed by bacteria, exactly. Okay. So We'll talk a little bit about why we care about BOD, but it's a surrogate for organic matter. It was the testing was developed at a time when we could measure 
oxygen consumption, but we couldn't measure organic matter. So we didn't have the tools at that point in time, but it's become standard. It's very useful because we're concerned with when we release this water to a, to a receiving body of water, so the wastewater itself, what happens? How much oxygen is consumed? Do we end up with anoxic conditions resulting in fish kills, for example, in the receiving body of water? Just looking at some properties of typical wastewater, and this is typical untreated wastewater. So you can see here we have BOD, typically ranging from about 100 to 300 milligrams per liter. We also worry about suspended solids. Why are we concerned with the amount of suspended solids in wastewater? Think about release of that wastewater to a receiving body of water. Why would we care about suspended solids? Same reason we put silt fences up around construction sites. We put filters um, around a construction site on the storm sewers. So basically, yes, the suspended solids can kill fish and animals. They deposit on the bottom of the body of water. They change what we refer to as the benthic zone. So for instance, if the bottom is rocky, that rock, those rocks provide a habitat for the organisms in that receiving body of water. If you fill up all of those rocks, coat those rocks with the sediment, you destroy those habitats. So we're concerned about the habitat in particular. We're also concerned about, in some cases, metals can be sorbed or other chemicals can be sorbed on to these suspended solid particles. And then over time, the metals can be released or they can be taken up by organisms, potentially bioaccumulated. We're also concerned with phosphorus and nitrogen. So you see total nitrogen, and that includes organic and inorganic nitrogen, ranges from about 20 to 80 milligrams per liter. Phosphorus, about 5 to 20 milligrams per liter. Why are we concerned? with nitrogen and phosphorus. Those of you in 480 should easily be able to answer this. Lab two, eutrophication, algae blooms, exactly. So nitrogen and phosphorus contributing to eutrophication, contributing to algae blooms, potentially what we call um, HABs, H-A-B, hazardous algae blooms, which some of the algae can release neurotoxins, Cyanotoxins, these are toxins to both animals and to humans. So as I mentioned, we monitor BOD. Typically, we use a five-day BOD. So this is typically what we're measuring, BOD5. That is convention. Why five? Anybody want to guess? Why do we do a... So we're looking at the oxygen consumption over five days. Why five? Okay, before it goes septic. Okay, so we don't, we want, ox, we don't, we want to measure oxygen. Why else? Anybody uh, want to try another reason? Settling? It's actually historic. And so if you look at untreated here, this is about seven days. And at seven days, we go from what is referred to as carbonaceous BOD, where we're looking at oxidizing the organic carbon to CO2, to nitrogen, nitrogenous BOD, where we're looking at converting the organic nitrogen and ammonia to nitrate. So that takes, that's about seven days. Turns out the reason we use five days is historic. It had, the test was developed in England. And the time that it, on average, that it took 
for water, wastewater to flow from London out down the Thames to the sea was five days. So that's why we use five days. It has nothing to do with a five-day work week. It's totally historic. Um, but just an interesting little fact there. Um, so you can see, actually, when we look at so if we're looking at BOD5, it's about seven days to switch from carbonaceous BOD oxidation to where we start oxidizing the nitrogen compounds. With treated sewage, it's actually much, rap much more rapid, about two days before if you're doing these tests, you're actually seeing oxidation of the remaining organic nitrogen compounds and ammonia. Now, often with a wastewater treatment plant, we're also treating industrial wastewater. Industrial wastewater is very different from municipal wastewater, as you can see here. So if we look at municipal wastewater, typically, BOD is about 200 milligrams per liter. Suspended solids is about 210. Again, I apologize for the lines. So for instance, lots of micro breweries. Um, one of the challenges with these is that it's not a continual load of waste. It's processed in batches. So it's a high load over a short period of time. So high BOD, high suspended solids. This can completely change the process. So for instance, in the Williamston plant, when Old Nation um, really started growing and increasing production, they started seeing significant changes in their wastewater, their raw wastewater characteristics, and that was affecting the treatment processes. So they had to work with Old Nation in order to deal with this um, before it became too much of a problem. Uh, it was interesting over that kind of period of time when Old Nation was founded and was growing, you could actually kind of smell that um, the yeast um, beer smell at the wastewater treatment plant if you were there at the right time. Um, slaughterhouses, tanneries, you can see very, very high concentrations of BODs. So because of this, we have a program that requires the pretreatment of industrial waste. So all nation is required to pretreat their wastewater. And the goal is basically what I just described. We want to prevent the interference of the treatment process. Okay. We want to make sure that we still have sufficient oxygen in our aeration tanks. We also want to make sure that there aren't massive swings in pH, temperature, uh, organic content, et cetera. And we want to be able to re recycle and reclaim municipal and industrial wastewater. And this has become a problem. Um, Mike may talk a little bit about this on Tuesday with, with PFAS. PFAS is very difficult to, to treat. It doesn't biodegrade. It ends up in the biosolids. And this has happened in a number of plants. And now we're monitoring for PFAS. But what happened in a number of the plants across actually across the world, is that we weren't monitoring for PFAS. PFAS was actually even used in the electroplating industry. It was discharged in their wastewater. 
it wasn't regulated under this pretreatment program, wasn't monitored in the water treatment plant or in the wastewater treatment plant. Those biosolids that had accumulated PFAS were then land applied. The plants uptake PFAS and it moves in the ecosystem. So, or the biosphere. So we need to be thinking about how do these chemicals move? And as we can detect more and more chemicals, how do we protect both public health and ecological health? So in terms of treatment, pretreatment program requires that you cannot discharge a waste stream that has a flash point less than 60 degrees C because we don't want explosions. Having an explosion in the sewer system, pumping station in the wastewater treatment plant, as you can imagine, is extremely problematic. We don't want waste streams with a pH less than five. Why? Why would we not want waste streams with a less than pH? Exactly, corrosion. So corrosion is a major issue. The other issue is the effect on microorganisms. So remember, we're relying on, and for the most part, we're relying on microorganisms to do the work for us. Oils need to be removed. When we talk about wastewater, we often talk about bog, fats, oils, and grease. Um, how does pH affect corrosion? Typically at lower pH, you'll see greater corrosion rates. Um, and it has to do with the presence of the H plus ions, dissolution of metals, which are more soluble, the dissolution is more rapid at lower pH. Fog, fats, oils, and grease. I meant to add a picture of a fatberg. Um, I forgot to do that. Do you want quick search? The word fatberg. Um, these, what happens, and think about this, the next time you um, are disposing of fat, cooked a nice, I don't know, nice juicy hamburger. You've got a bunch of fat in the frying pan. What do you do with that fat? Do not dispose of the fat down the drain. Why? Because what happens is all of that fat solidifies, deposits in the sewer, and forms what are referred to as fatbergs. Kind of like an iceberg but made of all that discarded fats, oils, and grease that were put down the drain. Um, I always keep a empty glass jar and fill up the glass jar when it's full, then I dump it down the trash. So in terms of how we regulate wastewater discharge, we now do it with what is referred to as a total maximum daily load. Okay. We don't regulate based on, well, or we regulate based on concentration and mass per day. Why do, why do we not just regulate on concentration? One, there's a lot of variability. So there used to be a say, saying that dilution is the solution to pollution. Is it correct? It does depend on the material. Um, but in general, we don't think that way anymore. Okay, we can think about that um, with PFAS. Okay, we have all this PFAS. We can dilute it. We spread it out over the earth. We can think about that with DDT. Problem is, 
in many cases, we can get biomagnification, we get bioaccumulation, and we also end up with mixtures of chemicals. And we don't, those mixtures itself can be toxic. So perhaps only one, one of those compounds isn't, but together it has significant impact. So the fact of the matter, now that we don't think about dilution being the solution to pollution, we regulate based on a mass of material released on a daily basis. Okay. And we take into account both the point sources and the non-point sources. So this, the whole process is a process of monitoring. It's a process of assessing water, the water quality, developing a plan that uses best management practices to reduce the non-point sources, but also to control the point sources. And together with this approach, we can determine what levels can be released by a water treatment plan. So what happens then with regard to point sources, so we're looking, for instance, at point sources along the Red Cedar. We've got the Williamston Wastewater Treatment Plant. We've got the East Lansing Wastewater Treatment Plant. We need to be con concerned with how much they are releasing out into the river. We also then look at non-point sources, so stormwater runoff, agricultural runoff. We can look at best practices there to minimize that those inputs, but we allocate that. We have a margin of safety and that determines our total maximum daily load. So based on all of this, we can then determine, for instance, how many kilograms per day the, of BOD, the East Lansing plant can discharge. Now, in terms of contaminants um, for removal, we've talked about suspended solids. We've talked about so we've got suspended solids. We've got BOD, nitrogen, phosphorus. Um, I've mentioned metals, mentioned PFAS, fats, oils, and grease. So in terms of really the major contaminants we're looking at removing, these are the major ones. PFAS is, I've added, it's really not major until very recently, and we're much more concerned now with removal of PFAS from uh, these wastewaters. And PFAS are used just about everywhere. Up and coming, kind of as you move through your careers, we'll also be looking at microplastics. Much of our um, clothing is now made from synthetic materials. It's not cotton, it's not wool. Well, if you think about it, when you put the clothes in the dryer and that lint that you collect, that's what you're collecting from the residual water and the, what's in the clothing. Well, much of that also goes down the drain. Well, how does that impact river, lake water quality? What chemicals potentially sorb to those microplastics? Are they toxic? So you're gonna see a lot more of that in your careers than I ever have seen in mine. So I've given you a couple links here. I will send out a um, link in the weekly message and another plant that um, take a look at these. Are, it's useful to look at these virtual tours since we can't do a tour of the uh, plant. Normally we would go to the East Lansing plant and the Williamston plant. But take a look at this. Um, 
we will do a virtual tour and one of the speakers will be from one of the um, local facilities. So in terms of treatment, when we talk about wastewater treatment, we divide up the wastewater treatment into kind of categories. The first being preliminary treatment. The goal of preliminary treatment is to protect the operation of the plant. So it's to protect your piping systems, to protect your pumps, to protect your valves from getting clogged, to prevent a fatberg from forming in the, plum in the piping network in the plant. So we want to remove initially the really large materials, the toys that some little kid flush down the toilet, um, the sticks, the bottles that ended up if we have a combined sewer system with stormwater and um, municipal domestic water, wastewater, things that just ended up in the storm sewer. Anything large that got flushed down the toilet, down the drain, etc. We also want to remove the heavy inorganic solids, sand, gravel, coffee grinds, glass shards that ended up in the sewer. And then we want to remove the fog, the fats, oils, and grease. And often we will want to equalize the flow and the strength of the wastewater. So when we talk about strength, we're talking about concentrations of BOD and suspended solids. So the bar racks, really the first of these processes, they're used to remove larger objects. So the kid's toy that got flushed down the toilet. And yes, that happens. Um, all sorts of things end up um, flushed down the, to down the toilet. Typically, these have openings of about one to two inches. They can be larger, they can be slightly smaller, but typically about one to two inches. You notice these are on an angle. So the typically they're on about a 45 to 60 degree angle. And these can be mechanically cleaned or they can be manually cleaned. So large material we're removing here. We can also have what are referred to as comminuting devices. These are devices that are used to grind or shred up the solid material. So you're not removing the material, but you're shredding or grinding it so that the, it's small enough that it's not going to clog your pipes not going to get caught in your pumps or your valves, that it moves through the system and can be removed in the subsequent processes. The grinder that's shown here was removed from the East Lansing wastewater treatment plant. Anyone wanna guess what this white material is? Yep, wipes. Flushable wipes, which are not really flushable and should not be flushed down the toilet. So please don't, if you, if you commonly do that, don't. Um, you'll make the operators much happier because they don't have to deal with this kind of mess. Um, it clogs the grinders. And if you can imagine, cleaning those grinders um, is not a pleasant task. Um, I've also provided several links um, that you can take a look at the operation of a comminuter, the operation of a grinder. Um, but so as you can see here, Okay. You're not removing part of this material. You're sh simply shredding it, grinding it, 
so that it can move into the next process. Now, with your bar screens, grinders, etc., you need to have redundancy. These need to be cleaned. Mechanical ones are cleaned on a um, timed basis, but they still clog, they still need to be repaired. So typically what you will have is a channel that looks like this, where you have stop gates, um, stop plates or slide gates. You've got a way to isolate that channel. So you can see, you can isolate it here, you can isolate it here. So now the flow only goes in one direction through the one bar rack or bar screen and then the other can be cleaned uh, or repaired. Okay. You also see fillets. And you may have seen the term in reading. Why would we have these fillets? So here's our channel. Water's flowing into the screen. Why fillets? If we didn't have them there, what, what do you think is going to happen? Stagnation, buildup, particles are going to settle in those corners of the channel. So we put these fillets in to try and basically becomes more of a oval channel in order to try and prevent buildup. Now we mentioned grit chambers. We looked at these when we looked at sedimentation. So the purpose of these is to remove the inert dense material. So the sand, the gravel, silt, pebbles, coffee grinds, broken glass, larger material, inorganic. These typically have kind of a rotating flow. You see that. Oxygen sometimes is added to these, and so it's an aerated grid chamber. What we want to do is we want a horizontal velocity of about one foot per second. Detention times are short. Detention times tend to be about 10 seconds to one minute. We don't want to settle organic material. We just want to settle that inorganic material you can see here. This tends to be the smelliest part of the treatment plant, especially if the sewer system, the collection system is very large with a long retention time because that sewage can go septic. If it goes septic, you're going to have smell of mercaptans. You're going to have hydrogen sulfide, that rotten egg smell. So for that reason, so that oxygen, try and maintain a oxygenated water, reduce some of these odor problems, keep the organics in suspension. Grit chamber is a, is a sedimentation basin, operates exactly the same as the sedimentation basins we talked about. Here's a chain and flight collector. So we're collecting that inorganic material. Everything else should be going on to subsequent processing. Now, I mentioned equalization of flow. Okay. What's shown here is a plot of typical flow. You can see, not surprising, in the morning, flows tend to decrease significantly. People are sleeping. They're not washing clothes. They're not um, taking showers. They're not using as much water. So therefore, the amount of wastewater entering the plant is significantly reduced. People get up in the morning, take showers, use the toilet, the flow increases, water consumption increases, 
decreases a little bit during the middle of the day and then typically increases when people come home. So that's the flow. We can also plot the strength. And that's typically measured with BOD5. And it's the exact opposite. So the strength is going to be the highest in the middle of the night. It's going to decrease during the early morning. It'll increase again. And then decrease as flow increases. And then back to the nighttime. So we're looking in this case at trying to essentially hold the, the water in a tank, mix it over time okay, to equalize both the flow and the strength. And that because we have a more constant flow, a more constant strength, the subsequent processes tend to be more effective. They tend to work better. But one of the biggest problems is we need to prevent the wastewater from going septic. We don't want it anoxic. If, we, if it goes anoxic, we're going to produce hydrogen sulfide. It can be as explosive. We can produce methane, which is also explosive. So we have and toxic. So we need to be concerned with that. Typically, this aeration will consume, result in some consumption of this organic matter. So typically, will reduce the BOD by about 10 to 20 percent. There are microorganisms. Those microorganisms aren't going to say, no, I'm not working in the equalization basin. They work. They, they will consume some of the organics resulting in CO2 production. Why do you think we get greater removal of suspended solids? What's potentially happening in the equalization basin when we aerate? What process that we've talked about? We get flocculation. So we're aerating. These particles can come in contact with one another. They aggregate. So these smaller particles become larger, and then they settle better. So settling becomes more effective. So after pretreatment, and not every plant will have equalization. Every plant will have some sort of either a bar rack, bar screen, communicating device, <clears throat> and a grit chamber, <clears throat> not all will have equalization. The next process is primary settling. So we're looking there of removing the suspended solids and floating solids. We will remove about 30 to 35 percent of the BOD. This is the BOD that is attached to particles. Okay. We do not get removal of soluble BOD. <clears throat> We're only getting removal of the particulate material. And we get about 50 to 60 percent removal of suspended solids. These are the photos of the sedimentation, primary sedimentation basins from East Lansing. They're horizontal basins. You can see here the launders, the weirs, quiescent flow in the basin and over the weir. Typically have a scum trough. Remember, you've got these, you still have some fats, oils, and greases. You have this material that will flow to the surface. So we need to skim that material off, goes into a scum trough, and that can be further treated or landfilled. The design is exactly what we've talked about before. It is a sedimentation basin. We have a sludge hopper. Sludge is then pumped periodically to 
further treatment. With water treatment, we often don't need a scum trough, but we definitely need a scum trough. With wastewater treatment, we have weirs, slanders, same, otherwise the same that we've talked about. Um, you can see the chain of flight, same as before. With a circular clarifier, similar, okay? Typically the influent is in the center and the effluent flows from the sides. Again, we've got a sludge trough and then the sludge is, actually sludge is drawn off from this side. Okay, this is actually, notice here, we have an influent pipe here. Um, and this is, sorry, this is our influent water. So you can see it's pumped up here and we have the sludge trough right here. On Monday, I'll start here and we'll go through this example and then I will continue with the rest of the set of slides